Welcome back to another episode of Fed Smart Retirement Podcast. We got a great episode for you today. We've got Stephen Puckett, our co-host that's always here. And today we have a special guest, Chad Owen, that works with us as well. And we're excited to have Chad on. Chad has over 20 years experience in the industry as well, has done great things in his entire career. And since 2008 has helped protect over $300 million dollars in assets. He's a great friend and a great mentor of Stephen and I's and works with us, also helps federal employees protect their retirement assets, has great insight and great information. So the three of us are going to have a great conversation today and help every federal employee listening, whether you're far from retirement or you're close to retirement or you're mm -hmm. retired, you're going to get a lot of great information out of our podcast today because we're going to talk about the risks that you'll face in retirement and specifically the risks to your thrift savings plan. So we're going to jump right into it. We're going to go into some great information today. And the first risk that we want to talk about is a risk that almost everybody faces, but nobody really hears about it or talks about it. It's amazing. And it's something called sequence risk. And if you haven't heard of sequence risk before, we'll be able to explain what that is and talk about why it's an issue. You know, we see so many people Steve and Chad, we see them look online and see, okay, the C fund or the S&P 500 stock fund, it has really good average annual returns. So I'm just going to leave my money in that. When I retire, I'm going to leave my money in the stock market, let it ride the ups and downs of the market, because that's what it's done my whole career. And it's done really good for me. So I'm just going to continue to have that ride, get the highest average annual return. And then when I need money, I'm going to pull from it here and there, or I'm going to start monthly distributions. But I want to leave it in the stock market to get the best possible returns. And we hear that yep. all the time. But one of the issues that we run into is something called sequence risk or stock market risk when you have all of your money, all of your retirement assets in the stock market. So, Chad, do you want to explain what sequence risk is and how it can affect somebody's thrift savings plan? Yeah, I've seen this so many times when people go to retire. And, you know, if you retire at the bottom of the market, in other words, we just had a massive slump. And you say, okay, you know what? I think we're going to have a pretty good long run in the market. And you decide to pull out money. Well, of course, you know, things, if you're averaging a four or five, six, 7% return and you're taking out 4%, it will work very well for a very long time. But let's say, and this is just kind of how I feel things are right now. We know the market's been doing very well for a long time and we know it's really high right now. So let's say you want to retire in the next two to three years, next five years, or you are currently retired and you want to pull money out to live off of. So let's just use an example of a million dollars. If you use that 4% myth that we talk about all the time that we know that's been debunked many, many times. But if you have a million dollars and you're pulling out 4%, you're pulling out $40,000 a year. But if we follow something similar to what happened 2000 to 2003, 2007 to 2009, 2022, where we're seeing 30, 40, 50% drops in the market. So we'll use example of 2000, 2003, 2007 to 2009, and you're, you have that 50% drop. If you're pulling out $40,000 a year off of that million dollars and we have that 50% drop, now you're down to 500,000. You are not pulling out 40,000 a year anymore because that literally doubles the amount you're taking out. Therefore, it greatly jeopardizes the possibility of you running out of money. And that's if you follow that pattern, especially for retiring, let's say 60 to 65, you have a long time you're going to be retired. So if you continue to follow that sequence of up and down and you're still pulling out money to live off of, what happens when you have an expectation? I want to live a particular way. I have a set thing or a set budget I want to stick with. You can't do that when you miss time the sequence of return. And since none of us know, I mean, Jesse, you've been doing this for 20 years. Stephen, you've been doing this for a long time. I mean, we have 50 years of experience here and none of us can tell you tomorrow whether the market's going up or down. We can't tell you that tomorrow. We can't tell you that 10 years from now. We can't tell you that 15 years from now. Nobody knows the timing of the market. If that was the case, we'd all be sipping Mai Tais on a beach, all billionaires, right? Because we'd be able to tell the top and the bottom. 
Exactly. And one of the reasons we call it sequence risk too, and we're talking about the order in which we get returns, because to your point, Chad, if you lose 50% of your portfolio, so now we go from a million down to Mm $500,000, what people don't realize is to get back to even, we need a 100% return just to get back to even. So if we have a million we lose and we're now at $500,000. We need another $500,000 to get back to even. We need a 100% return. And because we don't know, is that going to happen in 18 months, three years? We don't know. So your income is either going to have to go way down or you're going to run out of money if you are pulling the same $40,000 a year, the 4% rule like you were talking about, Chad. And Stephen, nobody knows what the market is going to do. I think that's why so many people are uneasy because we just don't know what's the market going to do tomorrow or this year, right? Nobody knows what the market's going to do. Right. And there should be a paradigm shift in thinking when you retire. While you're working, you're contributing, you're getting a match. So those lows aren't as big of lows and you can write it out and you might have many years to recover. But to Chad's point, When you retire and you set up the distribution phase, you're part of the distribution phase, everything changes. And Murphy's Law says as soon as you go to pull from those funds, the market will be down. You know, we just don't know. So, yeah, Yeah, exactly. Accordingly. Yeah, we don't know. And you're right, Stephen. Murphy's Law, that is when the market's going to crash, when you actually need the money. Because when we're in the accumulation phase before we retire, like Stephen said, we might have time to make up for those losses and we have time to let it bounce back. Plus you're contributing while you're working. So you're taking advantage of something called dollar cost averaging. And we've talked about that before on our podcast before, if you don't know what that is, Google it. There's some great YouTube videos on dollar cost averaging. And then the same concept works in reverse in the distribution phase, where as we're pulling from it with the ups and downs of the market, we have dollar lost averaging. What? How much are we losing? Because now when we pull from it, when the market's low, we're solidifying those losses. Mm-hmm. And so we're losing money when the market's down. We don't have time for it to recover. So if you have 100% In the stock market, you are going to have sequence risk and stock market risk in your portfolio. And one of the issues with the thrift savings plan as well, we hear all the time, well, I'm not going to leave 100% in the market then. I'm going to do 70% in the C fund, 30% in the G fund, and I'll just pull from the G fund when the market's down. But Stephen, they can't do that, right? No, whatever you're uh, taking out of the TSP comes out rateably. So you can't just say, I'm just going to pull from the G fund. It's going to come out of the C fund at an equal measure. Yeah. So if 70% of your allocations is in the C fund and 30% is in the G fund, in our example, when you go to pull your withdrawal, 70% is coming out of the market. So you can't, in the TSP, like a lot of financial vehicles, you can't say, okay, my C fund is down, leave my C fund alone. And I'm going to pull just for my G fund because that is not down. I want to pull from that. So then people hear that and they say, okay, well, I want to run 100% to the G fund then because I don't want to have risk. I don't want to have stock market risk and sequence risk. I don't know when I'm going to need this money, but I definitely don't want to lose going into retirement. Well, sounds all well and good, but unfortunately going 100% to the G fund also brings its own inherent risk. Right, Chad, there's risk when you go 100% into cash like that as well. Well, I mean, you have inflation that's been crazy lately. So if you're earning 2, 3, 4%, but inflation's going up 8.7. And we also know this is important to understand. We talk often about inflation, but we know true inflation numbers are never what the actual news says, not even close. And then we have things like shrinkflation. You know, nobody wants to talk about shrinkflation, but I was in a large store, a membership store the other day, and I was looking for chicken. And this may sound weird, but chicken and beef, everything had something on it said 7% injected solution, saline solution. (laughs) And I'm going, now, wait a second. So this isn't really a pound of meat. We have 7% of this weight is the water. Or you go to buy a bag of chips that used to be 18 ounces, and now it's 14 ounces, but it costs more. Shrinkflation gets you just as bad as inflation. If you're in the G fund and you're not earning enough to keep up with inflation, let alone shrinkflation. And then there's also the reality of things that we have no control over. The unexpected expenses 
And, you know, one of the things I like to talk to people about, and as you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years, but I was doing this back when we did the lost decade. Do you guys remember the lost decade, mm -hmm. which was literally from 2000 to 2013, the S&P was at the exact same spot. Last I checked, 13 years is not a lost decade. It's 13 <laughs> years. So let's say you stayed in the G fund that entire time because you didn't want to take the risk of the ups and downs. What something cost in 2000 versus what's it cost in 2013? There's an inherent risk in protection as well, unless you have something that can kind of keep up with all those things. Exactly. And the the G fund interest rate varies greatly too. It's not yeah. something we can rely on. You know, of recent years, it's been around 4% per calendar year. But before that, when interest rates were way down, you know, some years we got less than 1%. So you can't put it in the G fund and say, okay, I'm just going to live off of interest and I'm just going to pull 4% just as a starting point. And then later on, I'll pull more for inflation. Again, you can't even count on that 4%. Over the last 10 years in the G fund, it's averaged about 2% returns in the G fund. So even living off a of 2% is probably not going to be enough. And then as you said, Chad, that is not enough because you have to account for inflation. So going 100% to the G fund is not an option as well because that does come with different types of risk, maybe not as blatant in your face risk of, I might lose 10% of my portfolio, log in and my account's way lower. But if you're retiring, as you said, Chad, in, in your 60s, that means you could live 30 plus years in retirement. Statistically right now, females have a one in three chance of living to their mid nineties. Males have a one in four chance of living to their mid nineties. And if you're a couple, you actually have more of a chance of living to your mid nineties than not. And so that means 30 plus years that we have to make sure your TSP funds last in retirement and getting 2% average in the TSP G fund is just not enough. Right, Steven? Well, what about unforeseen emergencies too? You might have it all calculated out to where you take a percent out of the G fund and it looks like you're going to make it. But like you said, you could outlive it. And then with unforeseen emergencies that pop up, what if you need 30,000 for whatever? Now, all of a sudden that, that time period, your funds are going to last vastly shrinks. So you got to take all that into account and you got to be able to keep up with inflation. Exactly. Exactly. So inflation is one way of wording it. And longevity risk is something that you'll read as well, which longevity risk means we're living longer than ever. So we need our money to last. We need it to last 20, 30 years. And I've been hearing a lot recently. Well, I'm doing pretty good. I don't need to pull from the TSP because I have my pension. I have my social security or whatever, maybe your supplement. But at 73, as of right now, the recording of this podcast, you have to start taking something from the TSP. So if you started at 73, remember, you still have a pretty good chance of living 20 plus years pulling your RMDs, required minimum distributions. And every year that you live longer, your RMD percentage goes up. So you need to make sure your money is going to last you 20 years. So the G fund is not necessarily a place that you want to just park your money either. That's not what we're saying. And then also there's something that comes up a lot right now. And the, the question that we get a lot is political risk. Like right now, Jesse, what do we do with the, should we just park in the G fund? Should we just, what should we do with our allocations? Because it's an election year. Well, there's all kinds of studies and all kinds of theories and opinions on that as well, that election years don't typically do too bad in the stock market and watch out for the year after that of the, of the stock market. It's the next year that could have a big correction and things like that. Well, the thing is, Political risk does not just mean who's president, right? There's all kinds of different policies, both at the government level as well as corporate level. You know, a lot of us have seen changes in the thrift savings plan on how you're allowed to pull from it and what accounts you can pull from and um, how often you can pull from it. So there's something called political risk. But again, that doesn't just mean who's going to be president, right, Chad? That brings all types of risk with it. You know, I've actually been to Washington, D.C., and I've spoken to congressmen and senators. I mean, I've been in this industry a long time. And one of the things I want to do is I want to make sure people, when they retire, 
They don't have to worry about things. They don't have to think about the constant up and down of the market, who's in the office. I mean, that's generally, if you're out in the middle of the ocean on a cruise, the last thing you want to think about is who's voting to change your actual retirement. Like when you get off that cruise, you have a different law and you're going, great, now what do I do? <laughs> Let's cancel the booking we just booked on this. And you do, it, the reality is the president is actually a very, very small part of who can influence our retirements. And we've seen drastic attempts to take over our personal funds. And so you're talking about a federally driven retirement plan as the TSPA, you have to sit there and think about how much influence can they change? How much do they have the ability to access what we have our money in? Because we know the G fund that can happen. We have to look out what's best for us. So there's a time I tell people when you can win the race, why are you still trying to sprint? Why are you still trying to take those cross country, up and down mountains, slick slopes? Why are you trying to do that when there are things out there that you don't have to worry about that anymore? There's so many options available to everybody that we just have to sit there and go, when is the time we don't do what we've always done? You know, I remember a time when I first got married and we had little kids. Now I have a big red pickup truck. I love driving it, but I had a purple minivan. Okay, why? At that time, that was the vehicle I needed for the stage of life I was in. But now I want to drive something that's more like a tank, that's stable, has protection, has safety. I know it's going to get me anywhere. I mean, we just had some massive snowstorms here in Colorado, and I didn't have to worry about not being able to go anywhere. You know, and that's how I want retirement to be. I want to know that my clients during retirement, and I find it funny, Jesse, that statistic you said about if you're married, you live longer. You know, I've met some of my client spouses and I can't believe they're living longer. <laughs> I'd be like, that lady just wants to take him out, you know? But the point is, is when you have companionship and you have time together, you want to be able to enjoy it. So you got to think about the political, the sequence of returns, all these things that can affect it and make sure you're in something that you don't have to worry about that. Exactly. We were talking today about a lot of risk. And so far, if you've made it this far in the podcast, <laughs> you're going, man, this is kind of a bummer podcast to this listen to. <laughs> yeah, this is a downer. But the good, the reason we're going over this is because a lot of people don't talk about this. And Chad, you were just mentioning the different vehicles and things like that. And the TSP itself is a fantastic accumulation mm. vehicle. It's great for saving the money. You know, it's match the opportunity to be in the C fund for low fees and things like that. And it's great for saving the money. But when it comes to the vehicle now that we need for the distribution phase, it may not be the most efficient vehicle. And it might be. It might be worth staying in the TSP. Depending upon your goals, you definitely can leave your money in the thrift. But you also have the opportunity to roll over and look at other vehicles. And again, we're not saying do that. What we are saying is you want to look at your plan, your needs, and your goals, and then set up a distribution plan and put it in a vehicle that is going to plan for all of those. You know, Chad, Stephen, people's biggest fear, the number one fear in retirement is I'm afraid of running out of money. Mm -hmm. One, The second fear right behind that is I don't want to have big losses in retirement. I don't want to have big market risk. And then the third one kind of includes political risk, but you know they worry about things they can't control, like political risk and corporate risk and policy changes and things like that. And it dawned on us at FedSmart years ago that the reason that people worry about those things is they haven't planned for them. They haven't created a plan to address those three things. If you're listening to this, ask yourself, if I live a long time, if I live 30, 35 years in retirement, is my money going to last as long as I'm alive, if I'm blessed to make it all the way to 105, is my money always going to be there? And if you can't say, yes, for sure, I know it's going to be there. If you have to answer that question and say, well, I'm not sure, I, I hope so. And it probably will be there. It should based on past economic cycles and stock market cycles. I think it'll be there. But if you don't know for sure, no wonder you're worried about running out of money. You know, if that's not addressed, of course, that should be a 
concern in the back of your mind. We don't know what the stock market's going to do tomorrow, this year, the next five years. So if you haven't planned for sequence risk and stock market risk and the market's starting to crash, no wonder you're uneasy because you haven't addressed that. If you can't answer this question, if the stock market were to lose a lot this year, what would happen to my account? And if the answer is, yeah, I would lose money, no wonder you're always on edge and watching the news to see if the stock market's going to crash this year. And then lastly, like I said, there's things that typically are beyond your control, but there are ways to plan for those unforeseen policy changes, emergencies, or political changes as well. So what we're going to say is that there's no fix all. Unfortunately, we can't just say everybody should do this. And if, if we had that, we wouldn't have a job as retirement planners. There's no perfect scenario, perfect amount of money that you should put in bonds or stocks or you know this vehicle over here, that vehicle over there. What you need to do is meet with a financial professional one-on-one, -on -one, somebody who knows the federal system and knows retirement income planning, and they can create a distribution plan for you for your specific goals and needs to address all of those risks and to help set it up so that you know, no matter what life throws at you in retirement, you've got it planned for. So unfortunately, we again, we can't say here's the fix all be all that's going to do everything you need it to do. But the good news is I can assure you there are solutions and ways to address all of those risks and to create a plan that will account for whatever life will throw at you in an efficient way if you've set up a distribution plan with a financial professional, at least now you know what to expect when those different types of risks that we talk about come out. So if you don't know a retirement professional that knows the federal system, you are able to create a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Steven, Chad, or myself where we can go through and also Nick in our office we have several people that have experience with the federal system as well as with retirement planning and retirement income planning because you don't just want to meet with a general practitioner, right, Chad? You say it well where also you don't just want to go to one doctor. You want to go to a specialist who specializes in retirement income planning, you know, just like if you are going to a doctor and unfortunately you get diagnosed with cancer or something, you know, extreme like that. Your primary care physician may not be the best to address that situation. You may want to go to, or you do want to go to an oncologist, a cancer doctor who specializes and has experience with that. So you want to talk to somebody that's experienced with federal retirement income planning so they can set up a retirement income plan to help address all your needs, concerns, and make sure all your questions are answered. So if you don't know somebody, again, you can meet with one of us in our office and our website is fedsmartretirement.com and you can go there and you can schedule a meeting. And a lot of you listening have requested information from us and we'll be happy to reach out to you too and set a one-on-one -on -one where we can answer these concerns for you specifically one-on-one. -on -one. So we appreciate you tuning in today to FedSmart Podcast. Chad, thank you very much for joining us today. Stephen, great to see you as always. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. FedSmart Podcast is meant for informational purposes only and should not be taken as financial advice. FedSmart, Jesse Black, Stephen Puckett, and Federal Retirement Consultants are not affiliated with any government agency or OPM. Jesse Black offers securities through Creative One Securities, LLC, member FINRA, SIPC. And Jesse Black and Stephen Puckett offer advisory services through Creative One Securities, LLC, an investment advisor. Federal Retirement Consultants, FedSmart, are not affiliated with Creative One Securities, LLC. For more information, you can visit FedRetirementConsultants.com. Thank <music> you.